How's everybody today? I'm Seamus Lennon. I'm a social uh, solutions engineer with Threatlocker. Um, solutions engineer, not a public speaker, so you'll have to excuse me um, as we go through this. Today I want to start discussing why we should be adopting a zero trust architecture when it comes to our environments. Okay? So we'll start off at the beginning. Okay? We'll talk about software. Okay? Software is what we use every day. Typically we use it in generally every single day. We've got our office applications, browsers, um, Acrobat readers, file sharing applications. That's what we use on our machines. Okay? But software is also used in operating theaters, airplane tracking, ambulances. It's even used in, in rockets. Okay? To say about software, the possibilities when it comes to software are actually endless. Okay? We can use them anywhere we like and, and use them in that way. But when it comes to software, those possibilities are also potentially bad for us too, right? So the reason for that is, is that at the end of the day, malware is software. What's the difference? It's just code. All it is is code that's been developed and executed within an environment. There's nothing that says whether it's good or bad. Depending on what side of the fence you're on, the outcome is either good or bad, okay? And when it comes to malware, and we're going to talk about malware today and, and where malware came about, okay? Like, the facts are about, when we, when we look at malware itself, 540,000 pieces of malware are detected every single day, every day. There's over a billion pieces of malware out there, out there, every single day. Every minute, at least four businesses are victims of malware and ransomware today. So what can we do and say about malware? When you look at the actual history of malware, okay, the early stages of malware were very simple, okay? Very, very simple. All they were were things that popped up on your screen. They actually said, used to say, you know, silly stuff about Bill Gates, but that's all they did. But malware then evolved into what we know as ransomware. Okay? And with ransomware, if you look at the history of ransomware, where it all started was, was in 1989. That's how far back it started, the AIDS Trojan, as it's known. Okay? In 1989, this would infect your machine. After 90 cycles, as in after 90 restarts of your machine, it would start encrypting your file names. Now, this is well before we had Bitcoin, and everything else like we do today. And the result of getting this actual ransomware off your machine was to send $189 to a PO box in Panama. That's what the solution was. Now, the actual developer of this ransomware, Joseph Pep, was obviously later on caught up and was arrested because of this, obviously using the PO box. Um, but that was the first documented ransomware. Then it started to evolve, and traditionally what ransomware was, it would infect your machine, and just your machine. So it was kept unique to that endpoint as such. But then that's sort of evolving. And in 2017, we seen a new type of ransomware, which was the WannaCry. So the WannaCry ransomware had the ability to spread across networks, infecting other machines and encrypting each and every machine within that environment. It, it propagated through networks using the eternal blue. Um, and we reckon that it was actually developed in North Korea. That's what they think. But the damage of this was completely different to what we had before, okay? because of its ability to spread. Now, we start evolving then even further to Conti V3. Most of you in the room should have heard about this already. If anybody hasn't heard about this, on the 14th of May 2021, a couple of months into the uh, pandemic, what happened? The HSE was taken down. It was the Conti V3 attack that caused it. It used PowerShell to send out cobalt strike beacons within the network. It used PowerShell to delete shadow copies of all of the backups. It used PowerShell and WMIC 
to download payloads and infect each and every machine in the, in the HSE. As you all may know, the HSE resulted back to pen and paper, cancelling all their appointments at the time, and, and just the complete network was shut down. It took them three months to get the primary systems back up in September, and they're still going on. I did read an article last week, I think it, we're into a cost of over 110 million from this attack on the HSE. And this is where ransomware has evolved. Okay? When you look at ransomware in the traditional sense, the WannaCry, before that, they would infect your machine. They would hold you to ransom. But that sort of has changed now. Not only do they infect your machine now, they now exfiltrate your data. So a recent study by Coveware reckons over 70% of attacks will have exfiltrated data. In other words, they're going to take your data, and whether you pay the ransom or not, you're not sure whether that data is ever going to be destroyed. So if it is sensitive company information, you have no guarantee that you're ever going to get that data back or it's going to be successfully destroyed. That's the way ransomware has evolved. So gone are the days in 2014 when we got encrypted, we would just use a backup, restore our systems, and we're back to normal. That's gone and that's changed. And the way the threat actors work these days has changed as well. So instead of attacking just individual organizations or going after individuals, they've changed the way they actually deliver ransomware. Now they're using the tools that we use every day to manage our endpoints, okay? Remote management tools. They're using them to actually deliver the ransomware. They're using vulnerabilities that they find within our operating systems, and they're going to exploit all of them. But they don't always have to use vulnerabilities because they can also use what we call living off the land. And living off the land means they can use the applications that are already installed on our machines. PowerShell, Command Prompt, both can be used to exfiltrate your data. You can upload your files using PowerShell, a, power, a simple PowerShell command prompt. Run DLL, another application built into your, your system, can actually run code from GitHub in protected memory. So it cannot be scanned. It's not actually doing anything on your machine. This is how they have changed and they have evolved. Okay? So what do we do about it? And how can we solve this problem? Well, if we look at what we're doing about it at the moment, this is what we're doing. We've got antiviruses, AVs, threat hunting, scanning, scanning, scanning. We're looking for the bad guys in our environment. And we're layering these applications on top of each other. But the problem is, is that none of these will take account for zero day attacks. They're going on by what they know already. It's like having a house alarm with lasers and the best of everything, security cameras and everything, and then going out and leaving the front door open. It's just not working. We know it's not working. So what can we do about this? What can you do about it not working? How can we stop this and stop being victims of ransomware and of these threats, the zero-day threats? Okay? So when we look at it and we look at what we're currently using, we know that it's not working. So where's the solution? I want to introduce you to what we call the triangle, the security triangle. Okay? The security triangle is very simple. On the left here, what we can see is what we're doing already. We're doing our scanning. We're checking for our known vulnerabilities. We're doing everything that we know. Okay? On the bottom here is our security awareness training. Okay? To teach users about being aware. Now, no matter how successful you are at security awareness training, 
there's always going to be a Doris in accounts that's going to click on silly links and install some. So you can't always rely on that. Where most people fall down is, is on the right-hand side, which is where our controls are. It, these are the things that control what, ha what can and cannot happen in our environment. The most successful way of mitigating against a phishing attack is multi-factor authentication. It's very simple. Whether somebody puts in credentials or not, with multi-factor authentication, you're eliminating that. You can just change somebody's password, but they can't get into the system. And the control side of things is where we're falling down when it comes to our security and how we protect ourselves. So on the control side of this triangle, you can see that what we have in here, we've got our traditional firewalls, our multi-factor authentication. But then let's introduce more tools to that, okay? Application whitelisting. Basically allow only the applications that you want to run in your environment to run. We've got ring fencing, which controls what they can and cannot do. And storage control to protect our, our actual data. All of this is about what we call zero trust. And the idea of zero trust is given the least amount of privileges to our applications and our users within our environments. And the reason why I say applications is, is that every application that you run on your machine has exactly the same access to all of your data that you have as a user. Very simple. Google Chrome has all those privileges that you have as a user to access all of that confidential information within your environment. So let's start minimizing the risk and start enhancing how we can protect ourselves, okay? So zero trust security, it blocks everything by default, okay? Once we're in a zero trust environment, we're only allowing the tools to run that we wish to allow to run and we're going to block and deny everything else, okay? So with Threat Locker, there's a number of ways that we do this and we approach the zero trust model. So firstly, application whitelisting. Allow only the applications that you want to run within your environment and deny any executable of any process that you do not pre-approve beforehand. Why is this so important? zero-day attacks, using processes that we haven't pre-approved. Because we haven't pre-approved them, we've stopped them from executing in our environment. Any vulnerabilities that they're going to execute by, by taking any of our, our, our files, we're going to stop and deny that. Ring fencing. Of the allowed applications we're going to allow in our environment, we're going to put controls around them. Do we want Microsoft Office to be able to access PowerShell? No, we don't. Because that is actually one of the most common ways ransomware is brought into our environment. It's Microsoft Office links, clicking on PowerShell to download a payload. So we're going to stop PowerShell from doing that and Office from accessing that. Again, PowerShell. PowerShell has the ability to exfiltrate all of our data. What are we going to do? We're going to stop PowerShell from accessing our data. We're going to control what it can access. Very simply, stopping it from exfiltrating that data. Okay? Storage control. Storage control is basically putting policies around your data. What can access that data? What applications can access which data in your environment? As I said earlier, all applications have the same access to all of the data that you have as a user. Does it need that access? No, it doesn't, okay? Think about it. If your environment is infiltrated, what an infiltrator will do is they're going to look for all the good items. Where's all the good information? Where are your backups? Let's find the backups and destroy the backups. Why? Destroy your backups, you're more than likely to pay out for ransomware. So let's put controls around our backup. So for our backup location, the only thing you can access it is our actual backup software. That's it, the only thing. So even if somebody does infiltrate in your environment, they're not going to be able to access or damage that, that precious data of your backups. Elevation control. 
remove the user's need for local administrative access. Cut out those privileges. You don't need them. Okay? We can elevate applications giving users that privilege if they need, but we can do it in a controlled fashion. Okay? Finally, I'd just like to show you this, and this is how ransomware has evolved. Okay? Gone are the days the you know, spotty teenager in a bedroom writing code, infecting your machine. This is actually a support chat, genuine support chat, from somebody who was infected by ransomware. They were kind enough to actually tell them how they can get around and how they can avoid it in the future. Very nice and very speedy response. It's a full business now. It's no longer an individual. Okay? So we need to start protecting ourselves and start changing the way we look at endpoint security. Thank you.